We're all suitably familiar with Allen's hull. And of course, every single one of the mighty 48 horsepower that is 1400cc three-cylinder turbocharged Danish engine produces if you were brave enough to wind it up to over 3000 revs per minute, which we shall not do. People who are into engines will probably notice that this is a rather modest number of horses to be stable within an engine that weighs a quarter of a ton. This is intentional. As the maker book states, lifeboat engine reliability is paramount. They are disciplined horses. This is not a marinized tractor engine as some boats of this sort end up with. Allen's engine is very much untuned away from maximum power performance. Instead, designed to operate comfortably within the bounds of what its bulk might have potential for, a vague reminder of American car engines of decades past, with almost comical, implausibly modest numbers of horses within their 5-litre V8 blocks. 170. 190. How do they get such a small amount of horsepower from a car? It follows, though, that unstressed, untortured engines last longer, although don't mix that up with advocating running them as idle or very low revs for hours on end. Apparently these diesels don't like that at all. My DV48 is the turbo version of the DV36 and is the largest of this particular family of lifeboat diesels. The claim performance stats are consistently in line with that principle of take it easy, don't stress any parts too hard in hope that nothing will break. An exhaust temperature from a turbo engine of 580 degrees Celsius is notably tame. Despite the bulk, the engine only needs just over a kilowatt from the starter motor to turn it over and the torque curve is unaggressive. My only question mark is over the fuel consumption and cruising sweet spots for revs. We found on sea trials that over 1,800 revs, you get no more knots for your litre of burnt fuel. This is half or less of flat out speed for the engine. And we do want to make sure that we don't run the engine too slow for too long. I'm not minded to swap out for another gearbox with a better ratio. And I'm certainly not going to change to a new propeller with an even higher thrust profile as it would encourage cruising at even lower revs, bad for engine health and apparently for Allen's miles per gallon too. We beat the 5.5 litres per hour cruising fuel consumption indicated in the brochure by quite some margin, but Allen wasn't loaded up with fuel and supplies. Why am I going into all of this? Well, for a motor-only craft, the power plant is vital for good order, good humour and continuing to progress forwards. My past inquiries into fuel saver parasail kites and the like haven't been successful, either too expensive or not technically compatible. If the engine or if any of the family of components up or downstream of it decide to take some time out or give up on us altogether, we have a problem. If caught powerless offshore, Allen would become very vulnerable to wind and currents whilst awaiting assistance, even with a sea anchor. Right, so I need a backup strategy. And yes, I have considered the pretty extreme option of de-dieseling Allen altogether, but despite the protestations, prayers and assertions, sometimes all three from the comment sections, I can't use solar and wind generators to charge a battery bank and power Allen greenly and electrically. The numbers don't add up. Even if I decided to drop power to 20 horsepower, I suppose conceivable in tandem with special high thrust low speed propellers, that's still an ask of 15 kilowatts, not even taking into account all the losses between generation, batteries and an electric motor. That's a vast, vast array of solar panels and wind turbines. You'd need many Allens driving alongside, all burning diesel, to host sufficient space for it all. A more sensible option would be to turn Allen diesel electric, like the early submarines. Meaning, diesel generators to charge batteries, and then running motors from that stored charge. There would be some attractions to this. With the engine gone, I'd gain space, as motors are smaller, and there's less to break, arguably. And if the generators were mounted externally or somewhere clever, the noise levels inside Allen will be much more relaxing. But, and a big but, fuel economy. For a boat of Allen's size, capacity and shape, the engine is remarkably frugal in its demands of the fuel tank. Unladen on the water, we were burning fewer than 2 litres of fuel per hour. Even if you source the direct DC to battery bank system, the cumulative percentage losses at each stage are high. Depending on how I fancy doing the maths, a diesel electric Allen might be a little quieter and more spacious, but he might consume half again as much diesel compared with the current setup. Given that we need to do thousands of miles and carry contingency, plus need space for things like human beings and food, this matters. Allen does, as I said, need backup power. He may be alone at sea for long periods. 
We know that Alan, even split in half, can't sink. The only two real risks left are A, a fire, and B, losing power and being run down by one of these, or losing power near land and being wrecked on rocks. Alan needs a second way to fight the wind and currents. A simple option would be an electric motor that can be brought out of storage in an emergency, plugged in at 48 volts, the highest my battery bank could be wired to offer, and either chain or belt drive the prop shaft using a retrofitted wheel of some sort. But, very expensive, very heavy, it would drain my batteries fast unless I ran a generator too, and the belt drive system could go wrong. But one more thing, what if the disaster that's taken Allen's primary drive out of action isn't as isolated as a broken down engine? What if the propeller and or the rudder has been smashed? I'll have lost steering as well as drive, and my motor replacement master plan ends up useless. Yes, I could fix on a fold-out backup rudder and tiller, but that's two things to do. My idea, therefore, is this. Annan's engine and rudder setup will remain the default, reliable and efficient as I can reasonably hope for. If there's an emergency at the stern end of any sort, loss of power or steering, that I can't fix, then we do go to electric, but not in the way I just mentioned. Instead, we're going to have a rack of three 8 horsepower electric motors stowed on Allen somewhere neat but accessible. I'd have high thrust props fitters that don't need to turn too quickly, but can give Allen a fighting chance to either hold station or even make for a safe harbour. They'd run at my battery bank's highest voltage with all four in series, and won't rely on Allen's rudder working. I need to construct a robust mount that can fold out, bolt to Allen's stern, hold the motors a foot or two away, and using a rod control system, rotate them right and left to give us steering. Luckily, the rising popularity of autonomous mini-subs, powered surfboards and so on, means that these fully sealed and marine-ready units are on the market, and not as expensive as feared. Certainly, a much cheaper option than buying into a commercial electric outboard ecosystem, or even, gulp, a diesel outboard that weighs more than me after a substantial meal. I'd be able to plumb my design into my existing electrical system, and if I'm planning some sort of stern end railing or structure somehow, I could integrate it all together. Let me know what you think. To avoid this episode being 100% theory, I thought I'd share one of those, at long last, completed mini-tasks that have been sat semi-edited for weeks whilst I got my ducks in a row. In Alan's lowest racking bay, there's the day tank on one side, and on the other is the solar charge shack, and more storage. I'm dividing them with a rigid sheet of board. Mounting one end is easy, but it's floating at the other end at the moment, and angles involved are awkward for normal brackets. Glass fibre customization to the rescue. I'm to use a whole load of cut rectangles of high strength woven fabric. So I've completed cutting up all of the glass fibre into a nice rectangle here. This was simply out of a long roll which I had spare from another job. And now that I'm happy that the thickness is about right, you don't want it to be too thick because that's just pointless, but if it's too thin then there'll be too much flex in it. So it's a case of a balance of trying to sort of mimic uh, uh, making a, a metal equivalent. So this would either be aluminium or steel if it were made out of metal. Um, the reason why we're using the glass fibre of course is because I can mould it into whatever shape I like, uh, but I want it to have roughly similar characteristics. A little bit of vibration damping, but also simply strong enough to take the weight of a, of a large piece of board divider down there. But the next job, of course, is to set this up so that the resin doesn't get all over everything when I'm doing this. There's no mold, and so I can't keep it all within one particular item. It's gonna be simply on this board here. Uh, I can simply resin onto this polypropylene board here. This is the liner that I have on, on my work surface, but it's getting quite old and pitted and scratched now, and that'll affect the, um, the release of the part once that comes off. And also you have to flake off all the little bits of resin that are sp spilling out from around it. So I, I, it's just a bit messy. So what I do prefer to do is either use a proper release film, which uh, you, you buy on a roll from a composites place, whether you're doing carbon fibre parts or glass fibre, whatever. You buy a, a sort of a very thin release film that you've probably seen me do in, in other videos. But I also can use normal silicon paper. It releases well from silicon paper. And if I hadn't have scrunched it up, I do have an unscrunched piece over there, then it means you get a nice flat surface and you get a, uh, you don't have to do quite so much sanding afterwards to get a flat, uh, a flat result. And it's just a cheap, easy way of getting release from whatever resin you're using. Polyester resin doesn't stick quite as vigorously as epoxy resin. Uh, but it still does like to grab onto things, so it's better to use a, a release whenever you can. I also need to protect the two pieces of, I think, one piece of wood and one piece of glass fibre I have down there, and they're going to be used as the clamps to keep it in shape, and I don't want the resin sticking to those either. Laying up with polyester resin is straightforward, and despite the fact the clamping into shape won't take too long, 
I won't go too heavy on the catalyst, since thick laminates like this can overheat during curing. I'm also not worrying about being generous with the resin, as weight saving isn't a consideration for this part. If it were, I'd roll, squeegee and soak up excess resin. After some angle grinder fandango, this is what I ended up with. The perfect size and twist. It, and a flat metal bracket it's to be twinned with, gets a coat of paint for purely cosmetic reasons, and we're tensely poised to install the whole thing. You can see this floating end, and I'm using an already installed bolt on the box section crossbeam as my anchor point. Otherwise, really it's just a case of a few careful lineups to get the parts square, and use of wide washers to spread out the compression. The board is mere chipboard, and could be crushed otherwise. It's so hot down here. It was the start of our mini English heat wave. Despite that, wonderment of all sorts complete, and Paul, another kind channel supporter, I hope would approve. But only once I've swapped the bolts out for shorter ones, a trip to the hardware store is needed. That's it. Don't forget to share your wisdom, shock and horror about the electric motor plan in the comments. Bye.